horrible battlefield. They wouldn't go back up without Private Doss going with them. And so why were they waiting? Because Private Doss was praying. Did you catch one of the important lines that he had? I can't, I can't live with myself, can I? If I don't live what I believe. We're in a series on evaluations. And we need to be evaluating ourselves as well as evaluating our church. And, and evaluations um, have all different kinds of forms to them, don't they? Um, if you're in school, aren't you taking tests? Uh, you're getting evaluated on work that you do. Uh, you're evaluated on the job, how well you're performing. You may get performance <laughs> reviews. Uh, you, you're evaluating people as you drive down the road, aren't we? You, know, you, you better be. If you're going to be a defensive driver and be safe, you need to be evaluating what other people are doing around you. You need to evaluate road conditions. Like when you're driving through the fog, you need to evaluate how fast you should go, right? Even though the speed limit says certain thing, you may want to go a little slower. We had to be evaluating all the time in all kinds of situations. Now, we're evaluating one another, aren't we? You evaluated people when you walked in this morning, didn't you? You evaluated where you were going to sit. You evaluated how comfortable the chair was. You've evaluated the videos. You've evaluated the song. It's comfortable, Cassandra. <laughs> You've been evaluating, and we are doing that all the time, and God's evaluating us as well. And so as a part of our series on evaluating, we're kind of asking questions of ourselves as we go through this series. And the question for today is, how well are you living your witness? How well are you living your witness? And, and that's also a question for our church. How well are we as a, a congregation of Christ followers, how well are we living our witness? How well are we living what we say we believe? And is that visible so others can see that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 12. Instead, we were gentle among you, like, like young children among you would be another description of that. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless were we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. What kind of example are you setting for other people? Today, as, as we think about Memorial Day, we need to realize that we're all, in, in a sense, on a fighting an enemy, aren't we? We all together need to be encouraging one another and helping one another in the faith. A good soldier knows where their allegiance lies, don't they? A soldier is proud to wear the flag on his sleeve. And we too need to proudly lift the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ, our flag on our sleeve if you are saved, you've been called to serve Jesus Christ and his cross. And the question you need to be evaluating yourself with this morning is, are you living in a way that pleases the Lord or are there areas of your life that need improvement? Private Desmond Doss walked into the bloodiest battle of World War II's Pacific Theater with nothing protected himself Say, accept his Bible and his faith in God. Doss, um, if you don't know the story, was a devout Seventh-day Adventist and a conscientious objector. He enlisted as a medic and refused to carry a rifle. 
before he got to Okinawa, he had already won two bronze stars because of the different soldiers that he had rescued. One time he actually crawls up within 20 feet of an enemy position, enemy gunfire, in order to grab another soldier and pull him back to safety. And he did things like that before he got to Okinawa. So when he got up on the, uh, climbed up Hacksaw Ridge and the battle started waging, and by the way, it was, this was a, probably the bloodiest battle you know, was on Okinawa in the whole war. And why was it so? It was because this was the island that was the last island before you headed to Japan. This was about breaking the back of the emperor. Fighting took place on a horrible, hellish place called Maeda Escarpment in April 1945. There was a sheer 400-foot cliff, and on top of it were numerous fortifications, a network of Japanese uh, machine gun nests, and, and a host of booby traps. And we named that ridge, this 400-foot cliff, if you will, we named it Hacksaw Ridge because of how steep it was and it looked like a hacksaw. The mission to win Okinawa was thought to be impossible. Hacksaw Ridge made it that way. And Doss's battalion was, was ordered to go up the ridge as others' battalions had been up there and failed and multiples been killed and they were ordered up the mountainside. Facing heavy machine gun and artillery fire, Doss repeatedly ran alone into the kill zone. Incidentally, his, his whole battalion was ordered retreat, and they were called, told to go down off the ridge. But Doss stayed up there. Alone, he goes into the kill zone, carrying wounded soldiers to the edge of the cliff and single-handedly lowering them down to safety. And each time he saved a man's life, he would stop to pray. Lord, please help me get one more. As I mentioned earlier, by the end of the night, he had rescued uh, at least 100 soldiers. And Doss is an example for us. A model of what a man can do when they trust God. Our text says that Paul and his friends who were there in Thessalonica, and remember they were only there for a few weeks till they got uh, there. The Christians were already getting beat. Um, people were already suffering. It says that they were actually stripping them and beating them. And it was already here. And this was just after three weeks of them preaching in the, syn in the local synagogue. And scripture says that, there's, that we are to be gentle like a mother and strong like a father. Mother illustrates gentle care and a father illustrates strong authority. And that's the balance of spiritual leadership. Gentle care and strong authority. Uh, by the way, I have to pause and say I find a word of encouragement for single parents here in this, in this image. Single parenting is really tough. The responsibilities of single parenting. How can you be everything for your children? And yet, what the scripture is encouraging us here is, is that with the help of God, a single parent can be both gentle mother as well as strong authority. Can be kind and patient and caring when necessary, but strong and guiding and leading and exhorting and challenging as, as well. What does the text say? It says, like young children among you, we were gentle with you. Like a nursing mother, we held you close and we tenderly gave of ourselves for you. And there's something special about nursing, isn't it? A nursing mother, is what's she doing? She, there's a closeness, there's an intimacy there, there's a connection. Mom is giving of herself to give life to that little child. Um, and there it is such, such love that is present between those two. It draws them close. I and mean, think about how just inches apart from face to face as they give them, uh, she, as mom gives of herself to her little baby. 
Paul says, we loved you. We loved you, and that's why we shared Jesus with you. Now, I find that kind of amazing, don't you? He's only been in Thessalonica. He got there for three weeks, and in that short amount of time, he's fallen in love with the Thessalonians, and he says, because we loved you, we shared Jesus with you. By the way, shouldn't that motivate our sharing of Jesus with other people? And maybe we also have to question ourselves, if we don't share Jesus with the people around us, do we really care about them? If we're unwilling to talk to another person about Jesus, then perhaps we don't love them. We, we loved you, and because of that, we share Jesus with you. In fact, we were delighted to share the gospel with you. We enjoyed talking to you about Jesus and what Jesus had done for us. We enjoyed telling you what had happened to us because of Jesus Christ. And as a part of that, we worked hard not to be a burden to you. We worked night and day. That, by the way, isn't that an image of a mom too? Jen was up at 4.30 this morning. She didn't just get up, she stayed up. <laughs> because uh, Tenley had woken up and, and then mom couldn't go back to sleep. Moms work night and day, don't, don't y'all girls? <laughs> Moms work night and day, but so do dads, night and day. And he says, look, we worked hard for you so that we would not be a burden. We sacrificed so you would be free to respond to the love of God and not have anything hindering you. We preached the gospel to you. We were a herald of good news, it says. We were one who trumpeted this good news that Jesus Christ was alive, risen from the dead, had died for us. He goes on and says three things about himself. He says, we were holy, righteous, and blameless. Holy means set apart for God's purposes. Righteousness means we've been treated as if we'd never sinned and blameless. We made sure that we didn't do anything in front of you that would harm our witness for Jesus. We took note of how we lived in front of you. And then he goes on with this other statement. He says, we were like a father to you. And the word for a father means a person who is both strong and courageous. We'll come back to that. Strong and courageous. We encouraged, comforted, and urged you to live lives worthy of God. It's the father figure who is the cheerleader exhorting, come on, looking to the future. Come on, you can do this. It's the father challenging them to live their faith out. Paul says, we lived among you what, like little children is the way my NIV says it. Here's another one that says, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. We were kind. Moms are kind of that way. I, I, I love watching Debbie and Jen. <laughs> Both of them have a patience that I don't have. A kindness, just a tenderness, a softness. Now me, I'm with Theo and I'm throwing him in the air and I'm going to be rough with him, but they are kind and patient. In fact, I marvel at moms what patience you have with children. We have a concert this morning. Paul's going to go on after he's uh, talking about this challenge and about being, he's going to ask us a question. Do you recall our labor? Do, do you recall how we worked among you? How, how we served among you? Do you recall what we did? Our, our lives were marked by poverty, by disrespect, by disrepute, by trouble, by persecution. Paul had it pretty rough. Yeah, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Is it important? Do you recall our labor, Paul says? Do you recall how we worked? We were, we were beat, we were abused, we suffered all kinds of terrible things. Why? For one purpose, because we wanted to share the love of Jesus Christ with you. How long does it take on the job as a mom? What are your hours as a mom? 
eight to five, eight, eight to five, nine to six. <laughs> moms are moms all day, 24 hours, around the clock, seven days a week. You never stop being a mom. It takes sacrifice to be a mom, doesn't it? It changes your whole life to be a mom. And Paul says that's how our spirit how spiritual leadership should be. And if we're going to lead and minister to other people, we need to understand that we're on the job 24-7, round the clock every day. We have a responsibility. We don't give it up. It doesn't stop just because we need some rest. What do you have that Jesus Christ has given you that you need to pass on to somebody else? Has God listened to you when you've complained or criticized or been upset or even angry at him? Do you need to listen to someone else who's upset or even angry, who's hurting, who's in pain? What has God done for you? Has God nourished you with his word? Giving you, giving you special insights that comfort and encourage and challenge you when you're depressed and discouraged, what do you need to do for others who might feel discouraged, need encouragement, need somebody to share the word of God with them? Have you ever received a, a word of special encouragement from God that you know he's saying, I love you, I care about you, I'm with you, you're not alone? Do you need to share a word of encouragement, send a card to somebody else who's hurting, sad, afraid, going through a tough time? <laughs> I found a great question for us this morning. It comes from Hebert who says, the lives of the messengers had demonstrated that they not only believed the gospel but also behaved it. And so the question is, do you behave the gospel? Do you behave the gospel? <laughs> are, are you acting in a way that other people can see that the gospel is real for you? That you're not just a Sunday going to meet in Christian. You're not just somebody who's pretending at this. You're not just somebody saying, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but there's no reality behind it. Do you behave the gospel? For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. By the way, Warren Wearsby says, a father must not pamper a child. Moms get to do that. Rather, he must encourage the child to go right back and try over again. Christian encouragement must not become an anesthesia that puts us to sleep. It must be a stimulant that, wakes, that, that awakens us to do better. Maybe we should ask it a different way. Am I conducting myself in a manner worthy of the gospel? Am I behaving in such a way that is worthy of what Jesus Christ has done for me? You see, we can't work for God unless we're walking with God. And we cannot walk with God if we're ignorant of what God's will is. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Here's one for us, guys. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, Act like men, be strong. Act like men. Conduct yourselves in a courageous way. Now, by the way, I'm going to be doing some things here for a few moments that, that are going to sound like I'm only talking to the guys in the room. But 1 Thessalonians is written to us all, is it not? <laughs> we are all being challenged to act like a mother and act like a father. And so, he's going to go on. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses is, out, is giving his sermon to Israel. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy is actually three sermons that Moses offers up. And he's preparing Israel to go into the promised land. He's a mere 120 years old, and he's about to turn over the reins of leadership of Israel to his young friend Joshua. Joshua, by the way, is somewhere in his 60s or 70s, so young chap. Joshua is the one who is going to cross ahead of Israel across the Jordan River. He's going to take them in there. He's going to take them to, to battle after battle in order to take over the promised land. <clears throat> 
And then before they go, Moses speaks to the people and to Joshua. And he says in verse six of Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. That's the same terminology that I just read to you from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Then Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous. How can we be strong and courageous? How can I be like a father David instructed Solomon in 1 Kings 2. He says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So what? Be strong and act like a man. <laughs> 1 Chronicles 22, to Solomon, excuse me, David, still speaking, Solomon says, may the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. King Hezekiah. He's there with his troops. They're facing a much bigger army. They're actually quite afraid. And what does King Hezekiah say to them? Second Chronicles 32, 7. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there's a greater power with us than with him. How can we be strong and courageous? Because we have a greater power with us than the one that's with the enemy. So God spoke to Joshua, Joshua 1, 5 to 9 says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. This is, they're, they're just getting ready to go across the Jordan River. And he's saying, don't worry, don't worry, Joshua. I know Moses is gone, but don't worry. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I command not commanded you be strong have you been counting that by the way how many times he said this be strong and courageous do not be afraid do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go what's the secret <laughs> to being strong and courageous the Lord will be with you what did Das keep praying Every time he lowered one man down that 400-foot cliff, Lord, help me get one more. One more. Paul never held back, did he? He never flinched the times that he was up and persecuted and, about and killed, stoned, martyred. He didn't hold back because he knew that God was with him. What's the difference between mother and father? Mother, a mother wants to provide what is needed in the moment, doesn't she? But the father wants to produce the product at the end. The mother wants to cherish and nurture and love and hold and affirm. And the father comes along and says, that's all wonderful, but we want to be sure at the end that he's living according to God's standard. The father wants you to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you. And isn't it interesting how God has set up this economy that says that a household should be led by a mother and a father and that children need both. And that's true in the body of Christ as well. We need the tender compassion of a mother as well as the strong encouragement and challenge of the father. And together, a mom and dad, parents, together, not separately, together. But there's some instructions that I think that might be helpful for us today to be strong 
And the first one is this, recognize you're weak. Yes, if you're going to be strong, if you're going to, by the way, guys, if you're going to act like a man, man, you need to re- recognize your weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. In weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You remember the scene where actually Doss is actually punching the wall? You know why he was doing that? Because he understood how weak he was. And he wasn't sure whether he could continue on with the battle of fighting these guys. And he was about to give up. And it was his, his bride who encouraged him and even said, we may never meet again. I may never see you again. But you need to continue to stay strong to, your, to what you believe. And he will go back out and he'll fight that court fight and eventually get the opportunity to go on the battlefield without a weapon. Recognize your weakness. Secondly, utilize your resources. Okay, you're weak, but there's incredible tools available to us if we'll use them. And what's the most important tool? Moses told it to Joshua. He said, Joshua, just stay close to what the, what the Word of God has already told you. Stay close to the law. Here's the way he says it in 2 Timothy. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's the Word of God that is our tool, our resource to be able to men and ladies to be strong and courageous. Recognize your weakness, utilize your resources, and, and this one is the one we would like to avoid. How many of you would like to just take a pill if you want to lose weight? <laughs> How about if you want to get more muscles, just take a pill, okay? Get, get, get better at whatever it is. Okay, I, I want to learn how to do computers or I, whatever it might be. I want to get a better job. Just take a pill. Don't, everyone wants the easy way, right? But here's the challenge. The easy way is probably not usually the best way. It takes work. It takes suffering oftentimes to let God shape us. And so the third thing is not only do you recognize your weakness, utilize your resources, but let God shape you through suffering. Let God shape you through suffering. And I have a, two or three verses I want you to just think about here. First Peter 2.21 says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ suffered. Let's follow his example. That means we may need to suffer. That's what Paul told them. Is, Look, we, were hard, we, we took all kinds of pain for you because we loved you. First Peter 4.1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. You may have to go through some pain to clean up your life. And then 1 Peter 5.10, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Life has suffering in it, doesn't it? Life can be difficult, painful, hard. We can hurt. And it's in the middle of that suffering that God wants to shape us. I have one last question for you. It's a real easy one. What do people read from your life? Some people say we're kind of an open book, right? And and people can look at us and see what we think and what's important to us and what we value. What do people read when they read you? When they look at you and see your behavior, when they listen to your words, when they watch how you handle difficulties and challenges, maybe even hardship, what do people read from you as you're going through the, the, the challenges of life? What do people read from your life? Men, what do your children see when they see you, when they watch you? And probably because of the age of most of us in here, most of us need to be asking the question, what do your grandkids see of you when they watch you? What do your coworkers see when they see you 
and watch your face and your behavior. Ladies, what do your children read from your life? What do your grandchildren read from your life? And, and to all of us, do the people read faith from us? What do people read from your life? Paul said, look, we, we were working hard to not interfere, to not harm you, to not mess you up by our lifestyle. We try to live a pure and holy way in front of you. Why? We loved you so much we wanted you to see Jesus. What are people seeing when they look at you? Some of you are going through some stuff um, that we've been praying for. And, and God's watching. And more than that, people are watching you, aren't they? People are watching to see how you're handling the stresses and the challenges and the difficulties and the pain of life. What are they reading when they watch you? Lord Jesus, I don't know how Paul did it. In almost every city he went into to tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. He was beaten and abused, oftentimes whipped and imprisoned, chased out of town, hated by those who were, as, as Thessalonians says, or that, that they were jealous of him and what he was teaching. Lord, I can only sense that it was your strength, it was your presence, it was your word coming alive in him. It was you helping him because he was oftentimes weak. And Jesus, we need that same help. Help us to love like a mother with tender, patient kindness and compassion. Help us to love others like a father challenging, exhorting, encouraging growth and to be something more. Help us to love like you who sacrificed all so that we could be set free. God, I pray that you would evaluate us today and that you'd show us if we are, whether we are living our witness or not, and what we need to do to improve it. In Jesus' name, amen. And what do you need to do to improve your witness? Because people are watching you. <laughs> Oh, and I should warn you, when you drive away from here today, people might just see how you drive too. <laughs> Neighbors just might notice your behavior. <laughs> so you may want to think about it ahead of time.